All right, everyone. I am on the line with Dalip George. Dalip is co-founder and CTO of Vicarious. Dalip, welcome to the Twimble AI podcast. Hi, Sam. It's great to be here. It's great to have you on the show. I'm looking forward to our conversation. We've got a lot of fun stuff to talk about. Rumor has it we may talk about AGI. I don't know, <laughs> uh, but we'll see. Before we do, though, let's start by having you share a little bit about your background with our audience and tell us about how you got started in AI. What was the spark that set you off on this path? Sure. Um so I'm an electrical engineer by training. So all my um, bachelor's, master's, PhD, all are in electrical engineering. It was during my time at uh, Stanford, during my master's time, I got interested in the brains. You know, if you if you understand how the brains work, and if you can build machines that work like the brain, that would be amazing. That the goal of AI, and I got interested in that problem during my master's time, and. Then I converted all my projects uh, in Dublin at, at Stanford related to something understanding the brain, uh, whether it is machine learning uh, that is more motivated by the brain uh, or understanding the circuits of the brain. Um, so all my projects, uh, course projects, everything got converted to something related to the brain. And then I continued on that to do a PhD um, and uh, met up with... Um, uh, Jeff Hawkins, who was at the same time pursuing uh, similar goals, and he had started a neuroscience institute right outside Stanford. So I, I did a PhD, which is an am amalgamation of machine learning and neuroscience, um, and also ended up starting a company with him uh, during my PhD time uh, that's called Numenta. Uh, and uh, in 2010, we uh, started Vicarious, um, Scott Phoenix and I started Vicarious to pursue that goal long term to um, build uh, artificial general intelligence model after the human brain. And so that was the goal or is the goal at Numenta. Why did you feel like you needed to start a separate company in order to continue to pursue that goal? Is there a, you know, uh, ideological difference in terms of the, the technical approach or, um, you know, maybe this will help us understand Numenta a bit in your direction. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so um, there are uh, several ways to take inspiration from the brain, and uh, several ways to implement that inspiration. Like, you know, how do, how do you take insights from the brain? What is the methodology you follow to take insights from the brain? How do you encode them? How do you build systems based on that? Um, even when you agree on the high level ideas that you need to take inspiration from the brain or insights from the brain, there are so many different paths you can follow in uh, making that into, into practice. And on that one, I have ideological differences with uh, Jeff, you know, who I learned a lot from, of course, and I, I, I uh, consider him as a pioneer uh, in this realm. Uh, but there are differences in how we think about the problem and how we want to bring it into practice. And, and one core difference is that I want to lean a lot on insights from uh, machine learning and probabilistic graphical models and all those things. So I want I want to take insights from the brain. And uh, even when I look at the brain for insights, I am looking at it from an algorithmic framework. Uh, and and I, I have a paper explaining this idea. We use this idea called you know, a triangulation framework. You want to look at the brain, the world, and Algorithm, al algorithmic understanding at the same time. So when you look at the brain, you have lots of details and a lot of those details are not relevant for machine learning. Uh, some of them are just for metabolism or some of them are just for communication. Um, so you want to look at the brain and find principles that are related to information processing. How do you find that? Uh, to find that, you need to look at it from algorithmic angle and also related to you know, what's the organization of the world. The brain exists in a particular way because the world exists in a particular way. So you want to be able to find that correspondence between the organizational features of the brain and the organizational features of the world and be able to un explain it from an algorithmic standpoint. And that's when you, go, you have found something insightful and useful. So being able to triangulate that and then putting that in a proper algorithmic foundation or, or computational foundation, that's something 
we um advocate is take seriously um and and so um and that's where some of the differences are hmm, interesting so it, you started that off by saying you know if we take for gr- for granted that we should be drawing inspiration from the brain and how we think about uh machine learning and and AGI and, and artificial intelligence i guess in, in general um I think even that is a controversial statement. I think I saw a tweet recently. I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it was maybe Zach Lipton. It might have been someone else. Uh, sorry, Zach, if it wasn't you. But I was kind of like, you know, is the progress we've made in deep learning, you know, a result of the inspiration we've drawn from the brain? Or is that the thing that's been holding us back? Uh, <laughs> in other words... You know, we tr- we you know trying to to pull too much out of this association between the the neurons and the neural network. Yeah, um, I don't know any take on that. Yeah, I mean, so the 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 neurons to artificial neural network inspiration is kind of oversold, right? That's uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, and and. Uh, biological inspiration is so fashionable. I didn't expect it to be this fashionable, uh, uh, so, but, uh, but it is fashionable, and you can you 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 can uh, kind of sprinkle biological inspiration on any, anything that you do, and uh, um, and 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 raise uh, a lot of money. Like, is it marketing sprinkle or is it or, sprinkle? It, sprinkle? Um, it's it's something at, that attracts people uh, because you know brain is this mysterious machine and uh, if you say that hey your your system works like the brain there is some attraction to that right and uh, and it's also I, I don't want to say that it is all misconstrued or people are trying to deceive it's more there is a natural attraction to the fact that oh could we be building um, machines that are actually working like the brain you know is this you know that would be that is fascinating in itself people are fascinated yeah. by that that idea um and but about artificial neural networks um i would say uh the, the correspondence between artificial neurons and uh, uh biological neurons and oh because of that it works like the brain that that is just a very loose um analogy that's not that's not what we are uh, after so i can i can make a few um arguments on why looking at the brain is important um, okay. so the first one is that um, if you're looking at general, general intelligence, um, artificial general intelligence, there is only one proof of concept we have. You know, what, what is the definition of artificial general intelligence? Um, the only proof point w- w- that we have and a reference design that we have is human intelligence, right? We know that you cannot build some arbitrarily powerful super intelligence, that kind of thing that, you know, we know that that is not possible. That doesn't exist and you cannot build that. Um, so, but we also know that existing algorithms are not anywhere as general as human performance. So there is a gap to be filled in. And whenever we talk about filling in that gap, how do we know that, you know, we haven't reached the maximum of what we can do with artificial intelligence? We are always referring to how robust are humans, uh, how robust are human, uh, humans are understanding language understanding um, our physical world, understanding images, being able to manipulate things in the world. We are always referring to human intelligence. Oh, wow, look at how humans, how robust humans are. So so, so the first is being the reference point. You know, this is, this is what general intelligence is. And the second is also related to, you know, machine learning itself. We know that to build systems that are fast at learning things, um, w- which are efficient at picking up new things, we need to make assumptions. It is, you know, there are, there is no assumption-free learning system. But humans seem to be in this magic realm where we are very good at a wide variety of things, but we are also pretty fast at picking up those things. Um, com- you know, compared to traditional, like, you know, standard machine learning systems or current deep learning systems, and so, so what explains this this magic? Why are we quite wide, and at the, at the same time quite efficient as well? So, and um, and our thinking is that it's because we are making this Goldilocks set of assumptions. We are we are making a set of assumptions which are so tuned to the world that we live in that it appears that we are very broad. But it is it is broad in this world, you know. It's broad under a set of assumptions about the statistics of the world, about the physics of the world, and and so then it is about 
how do you you know what are those assumptions which are very good for modeling our world and how do you encode those assumptions in a learning framework and for all of them we can look to the brain to find out what is brain doing how is brain encoding those assumptions and uh, you know how is it using that to speed up learning and inference and this is something evolution took a long time to figure out um, b- because it was not always like this all the all the animals that evolution produced uh, before mammals were not general intelligent generally intelligent they they had behaviors which were tuned for particular niches um but then evolution came up with this architecture which is the neocortex which was much more broader um in its capabilities so if we can look to the brain to understand what might be the assumptions encoded in them and what might be the principles that uh power um new, neocortex that would be beneficial so that's the way we look at the uh, neocortex i mm-hmm. i hope that those two arguments click sure is the the implication then that if you can accurately capture and and you know uh, t- set aside whether accuracy is the right word here but if you could somehow capture and encode the uh the assumptions that you know that's the major challenge with intelligence as opposed to the machinery which will then operate on those assumptions um yeah it's about what are the assumptions you know what are the basic set of assumptions how do you encode them in in your what what's the representational scaffolding uh, that you use to you know put that into your models and and what's the overall ar- uh, cognitive architecture that brings all of these things together perception action uh building cognitive maps language all of those things together uh to click and you know work like the human brain so that we can we can not only have a causal understanding of the world uh we can also plan forward things we can do counterfactual reasoning we can pull in knowledge about the world um at the right moment uh in the right context um so how how does all these things fit together and uh, looking into the brain which i include cognitive science and neuro science uh, in in that bucket um will guide us to how how do you put all of these things together mhm and so how do you start to capture all of these assumptions um yeah so um uh i i can you know um i can start from uh, language understanding and work way back right okay. so that could be one way to uh and and this is an example i use uh, quite often to show that language understanding is not just language uh, so if you have heard this example before you know pardon me because i i've used it uh, many times um so if i give you um two sentences um and uh, if i ask you a question and i uh, uh, so that's the exercise i follow if i if i um so if i give you a sentence john pounded a nail on the wall and then if i ask you a, a follow up question uh, was the nail horizontal or vertical Mm-hmm. then you can imagine in your head how did you ans- how do you how do you answer that question right so humans answer that question by imagining that scene when i when i told you john pounded a nail on the wall in your head you are actually imagining a john uh, you know a, a wall a hammer all those things and uh, <laughs> uh, and then you are reading the answer from that simulation mm-hmm. um so think of how the, is that how gpt3 works no gpt3 has just a <laughs> symbol to symbol association between characters and uh, it's it's based on the statistics of what it reads on the internet it, pull, it will pull out some answer but that's not how humans operate we when when we hear the language we are using that language to run a simulation in our head and where is that knowledge for simulation stored it is stored in our perceptual and motor systems and using all the experience that we have accumulated over our lifetime right and and so that's and now if i can ask you a different question i can change the situation what you know what if the wall was uh, made of styrofoam or what if the you know what if the hammer uh, did not have a handle i i can cook up all the situations and i can produce you know i can make you think about answers for those situations in your head so this is in so being able to internalize our external world and and run simulations vicariously um that is an important part of understanding language so so to be able to 
build systems that have common sense. You know, this is this is an example of having common sense. If I ask you, was the nail verti- vertical or horizontal? Mm-hmm. That's that's an example of common sense. Um, to be able to get to the common sense, you need to understand systems that are all the way from language to perception and being able to connect all the way. And so, so being able to understand, the idea that you have to understand language imposes a set of constraints on how you can build the perception system. So it cannot be just a um, discriminative uh, pattern classifier system like that we are building using uh, deep CNNs now. It it tells that your perception system need to be generative and uh, generative in a way that is controllable by top-down um, you know, language-based queries. So, um, so, so, so that tells us you have to build generative systems for perception. And then you also have to build generative systems for understanding concepts because language anchors on having concepts. Um, when, I, when I speak a word um, uh, or, or a sentence, glass is half full. Um, you know, what does it mean? What does full mean? Uh, or you know, what does emptying a glass mean? All those things, even without language, you have those concepts in your brain. And, and so how do you represent those concepts? Uh, how do you acquire those concepts? And how do you connect that to language? All these threads need to be connected together. Um, so that's, um, so I've now lost track of what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> I, think the, I think the question that I asked had something to do with, um, something to do with like, how do you start to capture, you know, these assumptions? And you said a bunch of really interesting uh, and and thought provoking things, this idea of, um, you know, us answering conceptual questions via running simulations. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, And then thinking about that as a generative process. That's interesting. Got it. Um, What's next? uh, yeah, and now, so so <laughs> first step in that one, if we, if we take a uh, step back and see what I said, the first step was basically you have to think of all these problems, perception, language, concept understanding, sensory motor interactions, all of them as connected problems. Currently, we think of all of them as individual problems with individual benchmarks, but that can drive us in the wrong direction. You have to, you have to see how language influences um, perception in in its design um so then you, you know when you look at each piece so let's for example look at perception as as i uh, mentioned um you have to think of perception as as a generative process it's not it's not a classifying process it's not it's not regression with lots of data to say oh here is the here is the image what is the label that's not in it's it's a generative process and and it has to be generative in a componential way, it, in a compositional way that you you want to be able to um, think about concepts. For example, if I if I ask you to think about a chair made of ice, um, you can you can think about a chair made of ice even though you might not have seen it before. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you you can you can think of uh, concepts and think of how it affects perception in a in a compositional way. And what pieces are compositional there? For example, the idea that uh, you can compose um, the shapes of the objects with different appearances of the object, or you can think of backgrounds and foregrounds separately. So these these ideas on how do you structure a perception system? What are the core assumptions that need to go into a perception system? You can get insights on that by looking at neuroscience. And is the implication there that as that you can kind of taxonomize our human ability to to compose concepts? Are there only, you know, some limited number of things that we're able to to compose in our imaginations or do well, like chair made of ice or red chair or, you know, these basic things? Well, yeah. So you can say that there are limits on what are the kind of things we can compose um you know what um so they're trying to to, to uh, is the <clears throat> is kind of thinking it i heard something in your explanation around kind of constraining the the composition and i'm trying to understand is that because that's what you think is happening biologically and we're trying to model that or are we constraining the composition just to make it 
practical from a computational perspective? Both, both. Biology is doing it because it 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 produces some advantages, right? So, okay. so if you look at what our visual system is doing, our visual system is uh, making some assumptions about how the world is organized, how the natural signals in the world are organized, and and natural signals in our world has certain properties because of the physics of the world. It is not some random things happening. The physics has its own its own um, friction uh, and momentum. All those things associated with it, right? And uh, so. Uh, because of that, natural signals have certain properties, and 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 the brain, your visual system, is making assumptions which are tuned to those properties, which makes it work very well on those kinds of signals. So if you if you if I show you pictures of objects and I change the appearance, your visual system will not get confused. Uh, but if I show you QR codes and ask you to classify QR codes. <laughs> The visual system will not do well at all. <laughs> that is, whereas if you take a deep neural network currently and it try to try to train it on classifying noise or memorizing noise, it will actually do very well. Um, so that is showing us, uh, that is emphasizing the point that I made earlier that those systems are not making enough assumptions about the world. Um, and if you make enough, enough assumptions about the world, it also comes with side effects that, yeah, now... You your system won't do very well at QR code classification. Um, you know you'll have to train a different neural network to do that. You won't you won't use a human vision system to uh, classify QR codes. So so that's the that's the trade off that is involved when you are trying to build um, you know what you call general intelligence. That generality has its own limitations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about trying to tackle these problems. At Vicarious and in your research, are you using neural networks as we know them, deep neural nets, as kind of the building block? Or do you, you know, like Numenta, have another building block of choice that, you know, is, you know, has more degrees of freedom in a particular direction or more constraints in a particular direction? So we mostly use probabilistic graphical models as, mm -hmm. as, our, as our building uh, framework. Over, um, uh, but graphical models itself has its own you know limitations so you have to kind of extend the extend the language to include programs so so you can think of uh, probabilistic graphical models extended with programs as the uh, as the as the language um, um, uh, some people call it probabilistic programs as the as the as the as the more generic uh, language um, but it that doesn't mean uh, we don't use deep neural networks or uh, so all of so we use uh, graphical models as a way to think about the problem uh, and when it, when you try to bring it into practice you you can so you can you can think of probabilistic models as um, building models about the world right so that is that is where all your knowledge gets stored and how how do you structure it such that your knowledge is stored in in the right fashion so that you can query it etc now when you want to do inference on this model and also when you want to do learning on this model you can use insights from deep learning and, and neural networks to train this model and to do inference on this model and and even in deep, deep neural networks these ideas are imported right um uh, when you think about Variational autoencoder. You start with a graphical model associated with the problem, and then you say you want to amortize the inference. So, so we we can use many of those uh, techniques even in our work. So, um, and uh, and when it comes to causal understanding of the world, when you uh, when it comes to causality, you kind of have to think of it in terms of graphical models. There is no way around it, um, and and then for accelerating learning or inference you can use uh, neural network uh, techniques. Okay. And you use all of those. And, and so how do you, you know, where you may be trying to solve this uh, general intelligence problem and think that the approaches that you're pursuing are ultimately going to get you there, how do you sculpt that down to something that is, um, you know, tractable, commercially viable, you know, whatever kind of your real world constraint is of choice. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what, how do you, what, what's kind of the path that you take to, to try to get there? 
Yeah, so you have to be really, really careful on. So, so one is, you know, we are taking a very systematic path to our our vision for general intelligence. If you look at the the kind of papers that we published, you know, so we first published um, recursive cortical networks, which is a model for a generative model for vision, um, and then we published um, schema networks, which is a generative model for dynamics. How how do objects uh, collide with each other, combine with each other, etc. And and these two are compatible with each other. The the RCN model that we published and schema networks are compatible with each other. Then then we published a paper on how do you use a, a computer system which has both this generative model for vision and generative model for dynamics in it to learn concepts as programs. So that was the science robotics paper that we published, uh, and then that was uh, you know how. The motivation for that paper was how do you teach concepts to robots? So if you want to if you want to achieve a task through robots, you have to tell it somehow what you know. How do you uh, how do you tell it you want to pick up the red objects and put it in the blue box? Um, and and to convey that idea, robots need to have concepts. Uh, and it is also related to the idea of how do you build AGI. So you, you can see that the papers that we are publishing are. Um, on a on a systematic track to you know building towards language and 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 the next paper will be about you know how do you use this concept for grounded language now we have to be really really conscious and and we have to be completely um open about which of these ideas can be applied in robotics and when and uh, uh, <laughs> because uh, when you build practical systems there are many other constraints that come from the real world right one is one is speed um, it, uh, if you want to apply robotics in the real world, speed is a big constraint. You cannot be slower than humans uh, by uh, three, you know, two or three times, uh, because then it's not economical to deploy at all. So, so all the although we develop these techniques generally, we we are careful in picking the pieces which we apply in the real world. For example, RCN is applied in the real world. We are using it in real world uh, settings. And it is it is uh, giving us a benefit because it can be trained very very fast. Uh, but the schema network stuff that we have done, we haven't applied it in the real world yet. And um, similarly, the the concept learning stuff. So we um, I I don't have a formula for it other than basically saying you decide on a case by case basis based on. Um, so the the product deployment, product development, everything is driven by the customer requirements and and then you look at it and say which pieces that we have developed on the research stream can be ported for that application uh, and the research part continues on its own its own path mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so the in terms of the productization is the the primary focus on robotic robotic systems or industrial systems or are, are there other elements that you're working on um, yeah, it's uh, the primary um, deployments are all uh, robotics in warehouse, uh, warehouses, assembly lines, manufacturing, uh, etc. So I, I can tell you what the problem is. If you look at uh, how um, products are made and packaged, um, most of them are still uh, done by humans uh, because um, these environments change over quite frequently. The, the products change over quite frequently and um, and um, it is not um, structured like in car manufacturing. So if you, if, you, if you think of car manufacturing, a car is designed, you know, you take two years to design a car right. and then you can set up, you know, you take another one year to set up the assembly line for it. And once you set up the assembly line for it, it remains stable for about three or four years. So you can amortize all the cost for programming those robots. Um, by you know selling a you know highly expensive product, uh, but that's not you know our toothpaste or our uh, our uh, razors. All of them are you know the designs change quite frequently. They are packaged in different things uh, quite frequently. So it's a high changeover situation. And in those situations, you cannot take a copious amount of times to program robots uh, because the situation changes quite frequently. And and that's where. Um, a lot of manual labor is deployed currently, and that's where our AI systems can make a difference because 
AIs are much more adaptable and you can you know change the situations and your robots will still be able to function in the in the change situation and that's where we are applying um, our robots and are you are you solving kind of these you know bread and butter industrial ro- robotics problems you know bin picking and and uh, pick and place and that kind of thing or are is that does the approach lend itself to either you know, different or more complex uh, problems? Yeah, we, we can do uh, much more complex problems than typical bin picking problems. Being able to pick up and manipulate objects more precisely and uh, do assembly tasks. Um, so that's where we are uh, focusing more of our, uh, our uh, deployments um, compared to just um, traditional bin picking. Mm-hmm. Um, and even traditional bin picking, the application um, areas are pretty you know narrow in that sense in the sense that um um it's only in warehouses that you can apply that um but if you if you want to go into assembly lines you have to be able to understand the objects and be able to manipulate them hmm. interesting interesting um can you can we kind of uh drill into the rcns a little bit and some of the, sure. the concepts there yeah yeah so set the set the context for us um, and how you frame that problem up. Yeah. Um, so the RCN model um, we developed it as a generative model for vision, um, and I I explained earlier why generative models are important because you want to be able to uh, ground your concepts and language on these generative models so that you can run simulations um, about about the real world in your mind. Um, so RCN was uh, the first generative model for vision that we built, and um, we used it for um, solving CAPTCHAs. Um, that, so that was, the, and we got uh, attention for the, basically cracking uh, text CAPTCHAs uh, fundamentally, and uh, um, basically making them obsolete. So you can ask the question: Why are CAPTCHAs important? You know, why you know why did we select CAPTCHAs as the problem to uh, tackle? And, and the reason is that CAPTCHAs exemplify the strong generalization that we seek in our models. So what, what do we want our vision models to do? We should be able to uh, basically tell the uh, vision model, solve this problem without having to give any training examples. So if I, if I give you a new CAPTCHA um, from a you know, new style, I generate a new font and uh, I put different patterns on it, Humans are able to solve all of them without getting millions and millions of training examples from that new style. Uh, our current uh, machine learning approaches do not work like that. If you want to solve a new style of CAPTCHA, you'll have to train a system with that CAPTCHA styles. That's not how human brains work. We can, we can solve it without specific examples from that. So that was the motivation for attacking uh, that problem using a generative model. And, and the reason why uh, a generative model, a correctly formulated generative model has an advantage is that you can, um, you can reason about um, the arrangement of characters in a, in a scene without having to see, without having to train on the combinations of those characters. So if, if a character is tilting left and another one is tilting right, you don't have to train on that combination. A, a correctly formulated generative model will be able to reason about that. So having bringing in that reasoning into uh, the the model was a core part of um, that model. So it is it is reasoning on the fly rather than um, just doing pattern recognition. So, so what is how, where does that reasoning come from? Yes, generative, but what is being generated and and what does that look like from the perspective of the model that allows it to get to Okay, I understand this capture. Yeah. So fundamentally, the model is about how do um, higher level of uh, concepts, in this case, co- higher level concepts in vision are objects. How do higher level concepts translate to generated pixels? That's effectively what the model is encoding. If you if you if you do not give the model any input, if you go to the top of the model and poke a node corresponding to uh, a, it will it will generate an A, 
and it will it will generate a background and gener- put an a on top of it and uh, and so fundamentally what the model is basically saying is okay this is how images are generated so it's a it's a causal generative model mm-hmm. and then now given an input given an evidence um what the model is trying to see is that how do you explain that input in terms of my causal generative model how do how do i explain all the evidence in terms of how i know about how images are generated so that means when it when it um parses a scene of uh, characters a captcha it will come back and say oh this edge is caused by the a and this edge is missing or this part is um, you cannot see this part because that is covered by another letter so it is it is coming up with a complete explanation for what is in the picture and and it is trying to find the best explanation for the scene in terms of what it has seen before mm-hmm. so that's so that's where the inference part comes in finding the best explanation and uh, um so hopefully that answers the question and, and so it sounds like from that explanation the the generative part of uh this mechanism happens during training and is baked into your model weights as opposed to i see this funky character now i'm going to do what you suggested we do as humans do some simulation generate a bunch of weird characters and then try to map back from the simulation well it is it is doing that simulation on the fly during inference um okay. so so um so the way it happens is that when uh, a piece of evidence is presented it 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 uh, in the in the first forward pass recalls uh, the 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 close by characters that need to be generated and tested so um and so the, the first part is uh, yeah, the first pass produces an analysis of the scene um mm-hmm. Oh, okay, maybe an A is present here, maybe a B is present here, etc. Mm-hmm. And then the backward pass actually synthesizes the scene. So it is. Oh. Um, so it basically says, okay, A is present. I it, it says A is present. Now let me try to generate that A and actually match to the scene. Does it fit? Uh, and how does it fit? Um, and then sometimes these local generations are you know locally correct, but when you look at it globally, those. local generations will not make any sense um um so um so the system by you know synthesizing these um uh, uh initial uh conjectures tries to come to a global uh, globally coherent solution so it is doing these um generations internally and simulations internally it's called analysis by synthesis um so um so yeah Uh, the simulations are happening internally and and the trick is in how do you make that fast enough so that you are not just you know trying all the things brute force um and and that's where the efficiency of inference comes in and that comes from one the structure of the model and uh second how do you do you know how you do inference on it and we do inference by this idea called message passing where all of these nodes are uh communicating their beliefs on you know what what they are seeing and and the message passing algorithm comes to a global consensus um very quickly uh, on what is there in the scene mm-hmm. okay um the uh so that's the the rcn and that kind of uh, was initially applied on the the captures um i guess one question i have is have you applied it to other types of captures um or only the this one text based capture problem yeah we have applied it only to text based captures problems and we are applying now that in real world captures in the sense of you know picking bins or packing packing uh, boxes uh, etc so we are applying those in uh, real world settings where a bunch of objects in a bin um they are cluttered there is occlusion um, um you can do um you know some sometimes neural network solutions work fine but they also run into trouble in many situations and uh, but we are able to apply the techniques that we developed in that paper in many many real world situations with uh, with great advantage got it got it 
Okay, and then the, you mentioned the schema networks follow that. Talk a little bit more about that and, and where its contribution lies. Yeah, so schema networks paper. Um, so this is, you know, in um, contrast to uh, deep reinforcement learning. Uh, so you, you can think of schema networks paper as coming out uh, almost a year or uh, two years after all the deep reinforcement learning papers got a lot of attention. Um, and if you remember, deep reinforcement learning uh, papers got a lot of attention for uh, playing Atari games at a superhuman level, uh, right? And uh, um, and uh, of course, they played it in the superhuman level, but it, in a very narrow sense. And, and one contribution from our paper was that showing, look, this uh, playing at this superhuman level uh, is not really, you know, if you look at it closely, it doesn't make sense because when, when humans play a game, we are building a model of what that game is in our brain. And then we are using that model to drive our actions. Uh, how do you see that? If I change a little, some aspect of the game, humans are adapt to be, uh, able to adapt to it very quickly. So for example, if I take the Atari game breakout and uh, insert a wall in between, um, humans will uh, immediately start hitting uh, you know, against in, uh, uh, so that it avoid, uh, the ball avoids the wall. Mm -hmm. A deep RL agent that is trained on this game with millions and millions of examples will just completely fail. It will it will just keep hitting back and forth at the wall. And that's because the deep RL agent, uh, as it is trained, um, is not building a model of the game. It is it is doing pure stimulus response matching. Um, you know, just like it's almost like, oh, if I if I hit your knee with a with a hammer, there will be that uh, response that is kind of programmed in, right? It's a, it's those reflexes. It is it is learning a bunch of reflexes that lets you play that particular game. But when you, if something about the world changes, that game doesn't adapt. And what Schema Networks was showing was, oh, instead of doing this pattern matching, stimulus response mapping, what should be done is learning a model of the dynamics of the game. And then using that model of the dynamics to plan rather than just um, react. Um, and, and so that's what Schema Networks showed. So what we showed is that if you learn a model of the game in terms of its causal structure, in terms of, you know, this is this is the cause, and if I do this action, this is the result. And if you build a model like that, then you that model is much more robust to perturbations that you can make in the world, uh, whether it is changing where the paddle occurs, changing the length or width of the paddle, inserting obstacles, um, even changing the nature of the game somewhat, um, you, you can adapt to it much more quickly. So that that was the contribution from that paper. Mm. And so uh, do you think that that approach should replace all of the, the deep reinforcement? I, I feel like if that was a couple of years after we got really excited about uh, deep reinforcement learning, we yeah. kept going with that same approach of, you know, policy networks and, you know, yeah that same stuff like wh why aren't we just switching gears to schema network um yeah so um so one is that you know um because uh deep th there's um a huge amount of momentum built around just training large networks right you know accumulating a lot of data um and training them and that is something that is um you can democratize very easily you, you, you know lots of people can do that uh, lots of in infrastructure is built for that. So people will keep uh, building large models and training them on you know large amounts of data because that's some kind of it, it's it, you, it's an engineering approach that can be easily easily uh, scaled up um, in uh, um, although the results do not scale, the, the activity scales <laughs> and and, uh, and people, follow that activity scaling because lots of people are working on it. There's that excitement around it. Um, so that's just the natural momentum around uh, things happening in the world, people following other people doing things. Um, and uh, so I don't think um, those approaches fundamentally will solve the problem. You know, you do have to build models of the world. You have to reason using models of the world. And um, I'm, I'm seeing... Uh, many people are starting to switch to model-based reinforcement learning, where rewards are not the thing driving 
uh, have you learned the model? Rewards are yes, th those rewards come in at the as the as the final step, but it is fundamentally driven by wanting to build models of the world and being able to reason about that world. And I, I think um, there is a, a switch happening in that direction. People are realizing that. Uh, but that doesn't mean it will change immediately. There will there is still a lot of momentum around uh, deep reinforcement learning and just scaling these things up. And I don't think the, of that as a necessarily bad thing. That's you know this just how things happen. Mm -hmm. So R RL deep RL is kind of notoriously difficult. As easy as as you make it sound that we just. You know, we've democratized it. We scale it up. It is notoriously difficult to get those models to work and to be stable and things like that. It is schema networks. You know, if we're looking at uh, uh, complexity uh, as a, a measure, is it you know more nuanced? You know, is it more more complex to to figure out? Is it you know? I'm I'm trying to get at uh you know beyond the hey we're we're yeah. we we've got some momentum behind DRL and and so we're just kind of pushing that direction like yeah. how do we compare as an approach if we've got some problem that we want to solve? Yeah, so schema networks uh, are uh, more theoretically nuanced and and requires more more of the deep expertise on graphical models and. Uh, 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 message passing algorithms, etc., to set them up and learn and make them work. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so I would say those are, you know, just like in the early days of deep learning, uh, this this knowledge was very specialized. It was, you know, uh, even before Theano, uh, you know, if you if you go up back to uh, the nineties, you know, only some people would be able were able to train uh, those things, right? So um, I would say. Um, our our ex schema networks are in that stage, whereas it is much more much easier to play around with uh, deep learning systems because lots of tooling is built and lots of people at least know how to train them. And if the training is converging, not converging, here are the magic tricks that you need to do. All those things. Um, so so in terms of uh, lots of people people being able to try. Even if the final system doesn't uh, is hard to build or, or and it doesn't work that well in the real world, lots of people can try at the same time the deep RL, right? So, and if ten thousand people try, uh, one of those systems will <laughs> kind of work, uh, and 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 because there are ten thousand people trying. Uh, all of those people will pay attention to that one thing that worked. <laughs> so, <laughs> and 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 uh, and that will continue. And and if you look at uh, lots of submissions to uh, iClear, uh, etc. Yeah, the, there are people. You know, there will be a paper that published in you know previous year which shows that oh, deep RL solves this navigation problem, and mm -hmm. then there's a paper coming out. The subsequent year is showing that no, actually, it didn't solve that problem. Here is how it breaks, and uh, and it, it will keep going like that. But the fact is that fundamentally, that approach has some shortcomings, and yeah. and unless we address those short shortcomings, which are hard to address, it's I'm not I'm not trivializing that problem. There are fundamental problems to solve there. Schema networks kind of show the direction in which we need to go. That doesn't mean we have solved all the fundamental problems there, and 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 some subset of people will. Pay attention to those fundamental problems and and push them, uh, and and uh, once they start showing results, the the tide will change. Mm -hmm. So going way back in our conversation, you made a comment uh, about GPT three. You threw it under the bus, said you know that's not the way human intelligence works. You know, but then you spent you know a bunch of time afterwards, kind of talking about how generative is the key. And you know, GPT is three is fundamentally it's a generative model. Is there, you know, is there some connection, you know, there that you know something like a GPT three, you know, if we're only able to harness its generative abilities correctly, you know, could in fact help us get towards uh, you know general intelligence or at least more general than what we've got today. Uh, 
Yeah, so uh, first thing, I don't want to uh, throw GPT-3 under the bus in any, any way in the sense of, <laughs> I, I think it is, it is cool, I think it is useful, um, etc. And, 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 and uh, I, I do think they will find uh, applications which are, uh, you know, very, very useful and, uh, and uh, you know, why, just uh, broadly deployed. Um, so, so I don't want to, uh, I don't want to uh, diss the um, uh, usefulness of the system and neither do I, I want to diss the, you know, the technical challenge involved in, you know, building something like that. Like, you know, pe- uh, people uh, uh, spend a lot of effort in building those things and, and there are technical challenges. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just trying to get to, you know, the connection between that kind of generative and AGI. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so this this uh, comes to what kind of generative? There are so many different ways to build generative models, and and not all of them are amenable to building general intelligence. And and GPT three is generative, but in a very very trivial way. It's a, it's a it's a you know you you can go in one direction. You cannot do inference on the model. You know, it's, yeah, it can it can. Uh, generate in one direction. That's not what we need. We want to um, build generative models on which we can do inference in arbitrary ways. Um, so, for example, uh, I, I just want to give you an example of how the generation is limited. Uh, the generative model capability is limited. If you train GPT three on generating images, right? If you you can you can basically say, oh, I train it. I give you the top half of the image. Uh, generate the bottom half. Mm-hmm. But the same model will not be able to generate the top half given the bottom half, or mm-hmm. the left half given the right half, or do in painting where I say, oh, I I deleted this portion, you know, generate that. So it's it's generative in a very limited sense. What we want is a much more dynamic generative model on which we can um, we can query, uh, we we can ask many questions that we did not think about in the during the training of the model. So many mm-hmm. of the Models are generative only in one querying direction. So, so it's not just the generative aspect. It's more about how many queries can we efficiently answer on the generative model. So that's okay. one one criteria that uh, that we need to consider um, when we c- consider evaluating the generative models. And if we map that criteria to today's technology or approach. Does is, is there a uh, does, does that criteria necessitate uh, graph at least of the tools that we have today? Uh, does it necessitate model based? You know of the tools we have today, or you know are those just a couple of the ways that you've approached the problem? So I think graphs will be important. Uh, model based will be important. Message passing will be important. Um, I, I think I think uh, all these aspects. I can, I'm uh, reasonably certain these 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 will be core. Okay, and um, you know, causal reasoning will also be important. But they, that, that's already connected to that comes from graph and yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, any any general thoughts on general intelligence before we uh, close out? Um, so I think. You know, we will uh, develop general intelligence while still uh, also developing narrow intelligence applications, right? They are, um, there will always be um, uh, narrow intelligence approaches to um, uh, some high value problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and, and, and when there are well defined problems which are uh, high value, uh, for example, ad- optimizing advertisements or uh, um, a- anything where uh, a little bit of difference can uh, give you a lot of advantage in terms of the money that you generate from that activity, you you can still apply narrow intelligence approaches and uh, and and so people will still continue applying narrow intelligence approaches even even after AGI is built, right? It's not uh, and. Uh, uh, if you run a thought experiment on oh, uh, if you if there is an intelligent system which is actually able to reason like humans, it might conclude that training a deep neural network is the right approach for a particular problem <laughs> when when it is when it is uh, uh, the the right match. Um, I don't know whether that uh, makes any. No, I, any- I, get, I get 
get where you're going. I think I'm kind of hearing it as like, you know, just because we're humans and among the things that we can do generally is calculate that we're better than calculators. Correct. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. So, so um, while we are developing general intelligence, all the narrow intelligence applications will also continue and, and, and those talk techniques also will develop. So in that way, I think of them as complementary, not necessarily competing with each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, Dalip, thanks so much for taking the time to share a little bit about what you're up to. Very fascinating stuff and uh, enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Sam. It was was great uh, being here. And uh, thanks for asking all the provocative questions. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you. Thanks.